Welcome to the Fintech Scaly Show. This podcast is sponsored by ScaleUp Consulting, helping fintech startups accelerate customer acquisition and set up business operations to scale systematically. When you're ready to grow, reach out to us at richard at scaleupconsulting.co. Now, over to the show with Richard Doty, founder and host. Hey, what's up, everyone? Today on the show, we have Mike Sharman, co-founder of Match Kit. Hey, mate, how's it going? Great to have you on the show today. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so stoked to be on the show today. Thank you. Cool. So let's kick off the show and maybe you can give us a, a bit of background about yourself and some of the business that you're in. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, the one that we're going to be talking about specifically today is probably the one that's keeping us up at night and quite exciting as it's still in a very early phase. It's called matchkit.co. And effectively, it's a website builder to help athletes better commercialize their careers. It has links to all of their social channels so they can showcase to their sponsors like what the value of them as a personal brand is in terms of their reach across social media, the age demographics, their splits in terms of follower growth. And as well as having a built-in inbox for their agents or themselves to receive commercial requests, as well as a built-in plug-and-play hassle-free merch store where they can create their own branded caps, t-shirts, and hoodies, and they can honor it and, and deliver products anywhere in the world to their fans without any of the hassle of the logistics. It's all via drop shipping kind of model. And then lastly, there is the integration in a charity or a foundation that some athletes have their own foundations. Some of them are committed to the cause outside of the field of play. And even if they don't have their own foundation, sometimes their teams or even just something in their community that holds something close to their heart is what they'd like to invest in. So we've, we've kind of built this as an ecosystem play, something that's not there to replace social media, but rather to almost revolutionize the way in which a website would work. So it's almost like a digital CV for sports stars, athletes of all tiers, disciplines and backgrounds. So something that's been quite an exciting lockdown pivot and play. Cool. It sounds like a really amazing company, but maybe we go back a few steps and understand how did the idea came about and also what problem are you guys actually solving? So this, I think I'm going to have to take you down a little bit of a rabbit hole here, but effectively I launched uh, Retroviral, which is a digital marketing agency in 2010 after having spent a two-year stint working in comms in London. And Retroviral has grown over the last decade to be the agency that has made more brands go globally viral than any other agency in Africa. So we've definitely got our school fees and learned a lot around the dissemination of content the growth thereof and how we can create brands to have like a cult-like following as well as that stickiness with that potential audience and to create an emotional connection with uh, target markets. Back in 2013, we co-founded a product, a software as a service product called Webfluential, which is an influencer marketing platform that connected brands with influencers. And once again, you know, take away the actual manual process of having to search for an influencer, find them on social, engage with them. This literally connects you via platform. It leverages a reach resonance and relevance algorithm so brands can see who they're working with and what will make the best sense from a brand synergistic perspective. And then back in 2018, we launched our sports marketing play as a sister agency to Retroviral called Retroactive. And we were fortunate enough to have Brian Habana as our co-founder. Brian and I were at school together and we obviously kept in touch during his Springbok career. He had quite an interesting journey parallel to his time spent in France. He went back to business school as part of his rugby playing and he was actually working on a platform to try and help athletes and rugby players in particular after they retire. So where would they go from a headspace and mental wellness perspective outside of that physical wellness? And the conversations we were having, there, were, there was a lot of like synergy, a lot of insight into you know, us wanting to work with athletes and not always just the tier one stars, you know, a lot of the niche sports, the lesser than mainstream athletes, those are the ones that really have phenomenal stories. And in 2018, we launched a business called Retroactive, where our first client was a supplements business, Biogen. And we took an unknown Joe, who is one of my mates, and he was in the worst shape of his life. He was in a bit of a, an upward battle with trying to get fit. And he almost became like our foil 
of South Africa's health issues. So we used him as our guinea pig. We documented his journey. He was partnered with a nutritionist and a bio, and he used the supplements as part of his training. He'd never run a 5K. He'd never posted to Instagram. So he became our poster child of influencer marketing. And it made that story that much more authentic because we know in this world, in this day and age, consumers are a lot more savvy. They're doing a lot more research and you can't necessarily just always work with an influential individual or a celebrity. One, they are very expensive. And two, they don't always carry the favor that you would have with someone who was just a regular person because that's you know the ultimate testimonial for the digital age, right? So working with Hobbo, we told the story, he lost 30 kilos and he went from never having run a 5K to actually completing the half Ironman in Durban last year. And it was one of the most incredible scenes, seeing him finish with 15 minutes to go. There was tons of PR that was generated off the back of that. And as we continued on that journey, we got to the end of last year and obviously the glorious moments of the Springboks winning the World Cup. And Brian returned from Tokyo and he said, you know what, guys, fascinating insight is that so few of those uh, World Cup winning Springboks even have a website. And it got us thinking, we had done some reading. I read uh, Mark Randolph, who's the co-founder of Netflix's book over last year's festive period called That Will Never Work. Just an interesting tale around scale and pivots from a VHS business and a rental business to an actual online streaming platform. And we had a dinner with a South African VC who's had pretty good success in the West Coast of the U.S., over the last few years. And, and he said to us, listen, guys, you know, what can we do in, in terms of scalability from a Brian Habana? And is it a supplements range? Is it an energy drink range? And we kind of had a whole bunch of these influences that we were exposed to during that period. And after the World Cup and at the start of the new year with global markets starting to go into lockdown, sports starting to see some suspensions, we registered our domain at the end of Jan in South Africa. We went into a hard lockdown in March and we said, you know what, let's get this thing up and running because this is going to be a great opportunity for us to talk to bodies, to talk to sponsors, talk to brands who are experiencing absolute turmoil from a sports sponsorship perspective. And then from there, we said, let's go, let's get this thing live. So from domain registration to go live was a three-month process. We had a virtual press conference, old school style launch, but with new tech and Zoom and Hangouts and all these kinds of things and went to market created a splash, got some interesting early adopters on board, leveraged rugby as a focus because of Brian's personal brand. And that gave us the ability to penetrate markets such as the UK, Ireland, the UAE, South America, even with those dedicated rugby nations such as Argentina, Uruguay, and Chile. And by translating the press release into Spanish, we had a whole interest from various teams. I mean, Uruguay has been busy onboarding 40 players from their side. So it really has been this the sprint to get up and running and to get live. But we all know, and I'm sure that all of your listeners that are involved in SaaS, it is a, an ultra marathon. So there are moments where you have to sprint, especially on the dev front, but then there's the actual adoption and there's the conversion phase that you have to be prepared to be seconded by your co-founders because this is really, it's a, it's a grueling test of your mental and physical resilience. I mean, awesome and a great story. You touch on a few interesting points and I'll maybe go into a bit of detail about, about one, your approach to market entry. I mean, obviously you had a big star in Brian Abana helping and at least moving you into different markets or helping you move into different markets. But what other tactics have you used, uh, either social or, or traditional to get up to where you are now, which is a pretty interesting space because I think you've got a number of followers and a number of sports stars already on your platform. Yeah, I think... It's quite a privilege because of the mix of co-founders around the table. We all tap into quite different audiences. So obviously, Brian's got like a huge fan and brand kind of following. Then my audience is quite um, marketing industry and digital in specific heavy. And it's kind of a mix between South Africa and the UK because of my time spent in London. And then we have Ben, who is one of South Africa's most decorated Call him a citizen journalist or you know the ultimate he was one of the original sporting bloggers in south africa and ben has become the voice of the fan over the years being able to give very defined and very constructive commentary and how he broadcasts he was also on one of our largest internet radio streams and podcasts um, as part of gareth cliff's show and ben managed to build quite an audience in terms of a very core focus mix once again with brands and with fans 
And then um, uh, with Shaga Sisulu, like, he's got a really big following because of the work that he's been involved in, everything from NGOs and NPOs all the way to politics and the work that he's done in public service. And by leveraging just our four co-founder followings and our audiences, I mean, we basically have the ability to tap into about 1.2, 1.3 million people across our own social channels. And, you know, that's been a result of the growth over the last 10 years, the work that we've been involved in. We all speak in some personal capacity at conferences or in webinars. And I think that that really has helped us. And, you know, people will say to you when you find co-founders, Sometimes it's a lot easier if you have some kind of personal relationship with them because it's more of a relationship and less like an arranged marriage. And I mean, for me, I've been involved in uh, startups that have exited and that's always the challenge is like you don't have a natural rapport with the partners that you're going to be forming up with post an exit experience. Whereas this, you know, we all had some kind of mutual respect and I think goals that we're trying to achieve. But at the same time, we also cover each other's blind spots so we're able to have very honest conversations, you know, because we've been doing this for a while. We all really know what our strengths are and, we, and, and we're fortunate enough to know what our weaknesses are. So we would try and develop tactics that play to each of our strengths. You know, like we are the opportunities where Brian can do one-on-one -on -one conversations with athletes. We've been working with an amazing partner out of Ireland called Myra and she's ex-World Rugby. And she's been able to also, once again, create intros and get our foot in the door to some of the bodies and some of the representatives. And then we look at those situations. For me, word of mouth has always been my like de facto response to launching things. And if you can generate that word of mouth, you know, the most important aspect for me is always thinking, how can you get the press and the media to cover your story? With that old school PR thinking, it's that experience that I had in the early days of my career, both in South Africa and in London. So for me, like that's the go-to tactic that I like to use. And off the back of the PR, the PR provides you the credibility because it's not you blowing your own trumpet saying how amazing your product or service is. It's the, the independent media, which has said that. I mean, the National out of uh, Dubai gave us the most incredible rave review and it compared the MVP of the tech world with the MVP of the sporting world. And it, it was created such a great juxtaposition, especially because Brian was, you know, the ultimate MVP on the field and especially with the 2007 World Cup winning exploits. And the exciting thing is with the generation of that PR, you then have collateral that you can then plug back into social. And for social, we created a 60 second explainer video. We created a two minute case study piece after our first six weeks of traction. And my view is always to market then create the case studies of what you achieved success with, infiltrate your own social networks first, and then expand that out into your brand's social networks, because those networks are always going to be a lot smaller than the core base of founders in our instance. And that for me, those are the three levers. It's PR, it's one-on-one -on -one convincing people via calls and emails, and then obviously the support on the social side and using your spend wisely, because you know, we're bootstrapping this thing and we want to make sure that we can grow as aggressively as possible while not being foolhardy and blowing the budget because we, we're thinking about this. And I, and I always think about startups as business revenue drivers first before going down the route of scaling audiences and burning cash because I'm more of a prudent type of builder. Like for me, I err on the side of caution before going to VCs. And I think in our market in particular, we're not exposed to as much capital as other parts of the world. So for us, we have to get to a space where we're generating revenue, we're cash flow positive, because cash flow is the number one killer of small business. And if you don't have cash flow and you don't have the consideration, then you have the potential opportunity to die a very premature death. And, you know, the stories out of Silicon Valley, the Facebooks of the world, the Spotify's, all these different brands and products and services, like they're anomalies. The average startup isn't going to become a unicorn. And that's where I like to think more with the balance of marketing hat, the balance of cash flow hat. And fortunately, we have an incredible finance lead called Didi, who's been with me on, on multiple businesses across the journey. And I think that financial acumen is so important for me as a traditional marketer. When I started out in my junior days, I had limited exposure to finance, limited exposure to accounts and management accounts. And, and those kinds of things are quite scary for someone such as myself, who is creative dominant. But when you actually understand 
your modeling, when you understand your margins, when you understand the basis of balance sheets and the basics of accounting, it actually empowers you to become a lot better business people in general. And I think for me, I like to scrutinize. I like to make these data rich graphs. It's an intersection of analytics and creativity for me that defines really good success within the startup environment. Yeah, some really good points there. And I mean, maybe we'll touch on the last point around data and making certain you have that data at your fingertips, whether it's, you know, the financial data to take to VCs point in time or the data that tells you your product fits the market. On that point, I mean, how are you guys looking at that? Are you guys gathering different data elements from your exploits into different markets that tell you, yes, you guys are going, let's push hard. How are you going through that process and what data or what metrics are you gathering to inform you of which markets? to enter it's quite difficult because you can fall into the trap of am i being spread too thin or am i being too focused and i think with any new product and something that doesn't necessarily exist or doesn't have a close enough competitor you have a lot of people talk about it it's like that startup analogy it's like missionary sales is what they call it so you almost have to do two jobs right you have to go on this mission and you have to tell people you have to educate them about religion first and then once people buy into the religion then you can offer them your specific god and that's what missionary sales is all about and i feel like we're involved specifically in that thinking because there isn't necessarily a comparison we're not the x of y you know we like to use a very base explanation to say you know we're like the future of websites or the digital cv of sports stars with the trading cards of sports stars for the digital world. And that takes a little bit more time. So for me, we had that 60 second explainer video. We generated the press release and sent it out to various key contacts from the major media around the world. And then that kind of informed where the biggest interest lay at the start of it. And that's why we were very specific. Using rugby as a niche, it was actually a lot more palatable than going too broad. In South Africa, our media industry and our market in general is quite small. So for us, we launched South Africa specifically to general sports stars and any life, I mean, sports media and general lifestyle media who'd be relevant or find a relevant link with Brian as the spokesperson. In the international markets, you know, rugby is still quite a small sport. So you've got Australasia, you've got parts of South America, North America is growing, but, you know, it's going to find rugby stories less inviting than the likes of the UK, Ireland, the UAE. And then one or two conversations with some Japanese press because of the recent interest with the World Cup, the growth in local rugby there, and a lot of the expats starting to play in Japan for lucrative contracts. So if you think about it as a focused approach, using rugby as our case study and our proof point, it was a lot easier to focus and say, cool, these are people that we need to go after. And you'll find that when you generate PR from one or two key outlets, then it starts spiraling into other people hearing your story and saying, wow, Brian's involved in X, we'd love to have a conversation about that. And I mean, even with the way like you and I started our conversations, like me sending you some links and showing you, hey, this is the stuff that we're working on. This is the kind of traction to date that then makes you interested in wanting to have the conversation about scaling. And, you know, we then get to have a different angle of fintech that your listeners may not have listened to before. For me, that's where I'm in my happy place is those networking opportunities, reaching out to individuals that can tell the story. And being on some of the greatest podcasts and some of the greatest shows around the world, which is a testament to both the insights, the MVP that we went to market with, and obviously the credibility of the co-founders. And I think trying to get all of those things right, it doesn't necessarily happen on your first shot. And so many businesses, your first one isn't going to be your kicker. The first one is almost a stepping stone to your second or third or fourth play at greatness. Some valuable insights there. And, uh, you know, as you guys look to move on and, I mean, scale up and grow, I know you know you are bootstrapped. You, know, you have to be conscious of where you focus your energies. Uh, I guess my question is is focused around how you're looking at that growth. I mean, what are you looking at? How are you looking at, at growing over the next 12 months? What strategies are you guys discussing as a co-founder team? What are you looking at adopting? So yeah, so I think for me, year one to year two is always very experimental. So we launched in June 2020. So June 2021 will be our first year of operation. And then we'll be able to really get a sense of what's working and what isn't. For right now, we are following a lot of leads and we're following a lot of gut feel. And right now it's like, 
it's the experimental phase of adopting customers. And then we basically handhold every customer along their journey. Some customers, it's a breeze and they set up and they're ready to roll. Others, you know, they'll provide insight where they got stuck or the aspects that they found needed more integration with the gaming athletes in particular or esports enthusiasts. You know, for them, Twitch is a huge platform. So if we start gaining a lot more interest within the esports arena, then Twitch is definitely a no-brainer consideration. But for right now, the volume doesn't justify us investing the dev time in that. So we have to work on the fly, both from a gut feel perspective, on an adoption perspective. And then as groups of people start coming on Uruguay, perfect example, it makes sense for Uruguay to have a Spanish-facing front end for their market because you know they're not an English-first market. So once again, we've said to them, if you bring all of the Uruguayan rugby players on, then it makes sense for us to be able to roll out a complete pollination from English into Spanish for that approach. And because our team is small, we can be nimble enough to make those changes. So we are following as many leads as possible right now. And sometimes it's calls at different times of your day at weird time zones. And I think it is, it's like you almost need to be able to keep that resilience and keep that energy up because one of these deals is going to land that will then give you a lot more increased revenue, but also an increased opportunity to case study why it's successful. And we have a very different pitch now from the conversations we've had to sporting bodies and unions, to the ones that we've had with sponsors, to the ones that we have directly from brand to athletes. And and fortunately, you know, like you have to look at it, like where's your energy best spent? And the energy is best spent from one to one to many and the one to one to many that is a natural fit with brands and with bodies so that's kind of where our key focus is now and you know we've been fortunate enough to work with someone like brian to work with someone like penny haynes for your listeners who don't know she is one of the most successful olympians of all time i mean she's still the only woman to have double golded the breaststroke 200 and 100 at the olympics and by being able to work with her and you know she's opened some doors and introduced us to some aquatics athletes around the world and we talk very specifically about 2020 being the year uh, it's the last generation of athletes i mean at my school growing up there were easter rugby festivals there were easter hockey festivals and so many of those kids would be scouted to go on into provincial teams or to be sponsored for bursaries to go to university and that hasn't existed. And when you think about some athletes who trained their entire lives for Tokyo 2020, you know, 2021 might be too late. It might be outside of their sphere of training. So there's so many people that could potentially lose millions of dollars worth of income because this year didn't materialize. And what we're saying is like, don't rely on external factors for the own commercialization of your success. Develop match kit, create one, and start showcasing people all of your skills, all of your sports professionalism at its best via your match kits and then obviously link through to your social channels and become the master of your own destiny you know use your links to reach out to brands to bodies to universities that you're looking for sponsorships this has the ability to almost eradicate victim culture from 2020 and corona infested kind of negatives and for you to really put the power and your best foot forward your best goal forward your best try your best swim time forward and you have the ability to start marketing yourself in the best possible way yeah cool and i mean you mentioned earlier on in the show that you know yourself brian and ben as the co-founding team have a dynamic relationship and how are you guys working right now as we draw to the end of the year you're looking out i know you are still experimenting looking forward over the next couple of years to experiment and move the business forward but right now what questions are you guys asking yourselves and what factors are you considering so you know the experiment goes to the next level and after that we you guys go to the next level so i think and you know in our lockdown i, I don't know how it was for you in london in particular but our lockdown was fraught with a lot of challenges. So we literally had curfews. We weren't allowed to go out of our homes besides for emergencies or to get groceries. And then off the back of that, like you couldn't actually travel anywhere between like eight or nine o'clock at night and six o'clock in the morning. So we were really restricted. And the one thing that I used to keep myself relatively sane, because also gyms were closed and there were no ways of being able to go to parks or anything like that. So I literally got on my bicycle and I cycled up and down my cul-de-sac 
most days during lockdown. I think I cycled about 600 odd kilometers in my 100 meter long cul-de-sac. And I listened to a lot of podcasts. And the majority of the podcasts I listened to were really around actually Reed Hoffman's guests. And for those who don't know, Reed Hoffman, he was the founder of LinkedIn. And he has a, a podcast called Masters of Scale. And he just had such fascinating guests. And it was everything from Shake Shack to Charity Water to Nike and Adidas. You know, there was just like such extremes in terms of the, the, the types of scale, scaling or scale the businesses that he would speak to. And, you know, the one thing that comes through in so many of those interviews is all around the demons of doubt and negativity. And there are days when you do, you have the high highs, you have the low lows, you experience the rejection, you experience the no's. And from there, it's like you have a lot more introspection in terms of like, are we on the right track? What are we doing? And I think that because we've got quite a resilient team that this isn't their first rodeo, we know that it takes time. We know that it's daunting and it takes years for SaaS to be able to get to the tipping points and the economies of scale that it needs to be a really successful business. But I, I think that even from the early days of the, you know, the few hundred athletes that are paying customers that have signed up with the 6 million odd reach of fans that we are connected to around the globe already, like we're seeing enough light in the startup tunnel to say like we're on the right track. And I think it is, we, we just keep exploring opportunities. We keep, keep meeting new people, keep having new calls. And it is the time of our lives now when we have the most access to the most senior people that we would never have in a inverted commas normal world. And I think like we've really just, we took the option to say, listen, there's a gap in the market. There's a gap in communication as well right now. Let's jump on it and let's give it a crack. And for me, I like to work not in business plans because I feel like they come with too much rigidity and a business plans forecast is always perfect. You can make a spreadsheet, say anything you want, if you want to be positive or negative about it. And for me, it's just do, just try and just explore different opportunities, different avenues. The amount of like dev updates and evolution that we've made in the last four months is quite unreal. Just because we're seeing the things that are gaining traction and then we're running with those. The things that aren't gaining traction, we put a pause and we wait and see because they may have a benefit at some stage. And I think that ultimately that's the approach that we're adopting. It's like, let's get as many of our fans or our athletes on as possible and I think it's Godin or Ferris that talk specifically about the thousand true fans. And I think when we've got our thousand true customers converted and we can really start seeing what are the real anomalies, what are the real consistencies, and what are the things that we haven't thought about yet that we could possibly look at incorporating. You know, like that's when products really start getting exciting. I mean, I'll use a real world example. South Africa had one of its first fighters in a long time actually graduate into the UFC. So his name's Drickus Duplessis. He went off to Fight Island two weeks ago. He um, fought in his first bout and he was victorious. And what was phenomenal off the back of that was looking at Drickus's data in his match kit alone, we could see both his match kit stats and we could also showcase his social media stats. So because he was generating so much interest from global media and UFC media in particular, Drickus attracted 1.1 million interactions via his social channels. He had 700 views of his match kit profile. Obviously, a lot of journalists going to the page to check out what his stats are, what his details are, like what his demographics, what's his background, who are his sponsors. But that for me, coupled with the 250,000 accounts reached that he on top, yet he reached on top of that, like that was a really great piece of insight to show that we're actually not just this digital CV. We're actually like an insights and data driven business. And we know how, you know, data is gold in this current economy and we learn stuff new. And because we've got a team of people who trust one another and yeah, and I think I'm buoyed by both the mix of pros and cons during this process, because it's really tested the metal, it's tested the resilience and we're just going to keep rocking and rolling. And next year, June, we'll have some insights and we'll have a direction on what we're going to explore further. The year after, we'll be in a completely different space. And I think that there's some really interesting developments in the U.S. college scene. There's an act called the Fair Pay to Play Act where, you know, the NCAA has always had the control of rights, images, and usage of college stars. Some, most of those college stars don't go on to make it into the NBA or the NFL. And their lifespan on their sporting career is limited to college. And now that these kids can commercialize their brands within the next couple of years, it's a 
a really exciting opportunity for products such as ours. I mean, cool. And I might just pick up a couple of things there. I mean, I guess it's around your, your attitude and maybe a bit deeper around the culture that you guys are trying to create. And it's the just do, just try and let's see what happens. I mean, how does that play out in a startup? And, you know, how, how do you actually embed that across the organization as you grow in scale over the next little while? The problem with product business is that it's so difficult to generate enough quantums of cash to keep things thriving and keep things pushing forward. And I think that's why a lot of startups, they seek VC very early on in this stage. And sometimes, you know, you can argue if it's, if it's the right stage or if it's too immature to be asking for cash, do you give away too much of your soul if you raise the cash too early on? And for me, that's why I feel like, you know, my strength is working in service and looking at being able to solve creative problems for businesses. So by having the retroactive as the sports business that sells a service, that sells content, that sells social media management and campaigns, that's really like plays in our favor because that's one way that we can pull in like cash flow and to make sure that we are covered and that our salaries are sorted. And we've got the one piece of advice that I learned early on back in 2010 or 2009 before I started Retroviral was don't let the fears of financial failure cripple you because the constriction of financial fears, it stops your creativity. It creates panic. It leads to desperation. So when you go into sales pitches, you're already on the back foot because you sound so desperate for that deal. And people don't want to work with desperation. They want to work with positive winners. And I think that that's been the most important lesson is like, what are the skills that I have to be able to get cash quickly? And then what's the thing that's going to help me keep that cash in reserve so that the cash hungry product is the thing that you can continue to still keep incubating while you grow in as natural and as not desperate a way as possible. Oh, awesome. And I mean, you mentioned during lockdown, you were riding around your cul-de-sac, 600 Ks, which is pretty impressive. It must be a big cul-de-sac. But, you know, what books or podcasts, I know you mentioned one already or a couple already, what books or podcasts are you listening to or reading right now that allow you to keep on learning? So I'm a terrible example because I'm like, I mean, everything that your parents told you not to do, don't read short form content, don't watch too much video, screen time, all of that stuff. But for me, my, my world is dominated by social. So I have tweet deck open. I have a stream of tweets of people I follow or phrases that I follow. And I just keep having a glance at that. I normally work on one or two screens. So I've, I've always got something like flicking through in my periphery. And then there's always something that I'll pick up on social. In the past, I used to read a lot more news and tech sites than I do now. So most of my information that I'm exposed to is very bite-sized. And then I consume quite a bit of marketing and advertising media from a social perspective and from a, a blog and website perspective, like the campaigns, the marketing weeks, the ad weeks, those sorts of things, just because it exposes me to what brands of different industries are doing and how they're communicating. and then. I literally read one long form book a year and every year it's generally December because that's the only time, you know, in, in our summer holidays, we get like a full two week break between December 16th up until the first week of Jan. And for me, like I'll always read one book in that time. And last year's one, like I said, was That'll Never Work by Mark Randolph, who's the co-founder of Netflix. And then my December reads are generally biographies or autobiographies of founders of tech businesses because like that's the stuff that I'm interested in and I get the best value from that so you know stuff around reading about Twitter I actually broke my rule of one book a year and actually read Sarah Fryer's No Filter it's the Instagram story and she's a Bloomberg journalist and it gives you such fascinating insights. And the, their perfect example is that Instagram was like they had their vision they had their direction they had like Kevin Systrom was personally signing off all the advertising from any brands that wanted to put content on social from a paid perspective during those early days of advertising on Instagram. And that's why the ads were so much better. Like they were crafted to look like the platform. Now anybody and their dog can create an Instagram ad and there's a hell of a lot of rubbish. I mean, Instagram has lost that appeal for me because there's so much crap to like filter through. And I think that that's a perfect example of like the guys, yo, they made, they made tons of money. So, you know, like you can't discredit them for that. Like they're multi-billionaires. But the reality is, is like that being sucked into the Facebook ecosystem, it has 
objectives to answer to. It has ROI that it needs to feed back into Facebook mothership. And if you think about it, like entire world is dominated by Facebook owned properties now. It's WhatsApp, it's Facebook, it's Instagram. And that's a terrifying reality. I mean, the social dilemma obviously is extremes of that, the great hack, but we're living in a very strange time and we're living in a space where we don't know how much are we being manipulated and how much are we actually choosing to consume content because it's our choice. And I think that, you know, like for me, I'm always very wary of the stuff that I expose myself to, but yeah, the Reed Hoffman podcast, the Sarah Fryer, No Filter I've read some stuff around Elon Musk and stuff around Twitter and Jack Dorsey recently. So yeah, that's kind of where my brain likes to go to because I'm inspired by founder stories because I know how hard it is to actually scale. And I know how hard it is in those first few years to actually gain traction. And when I look back at some of the proposals and the pitch decks that I was working on in 2010, I'm like, how did I even get business? How did we continue to survive? And there's a great line that I picked up. I think it was from Tim Ferriss in one of the podcasts I listened to during lockdown. And then the line resonated with me because it talks to my personality. And his line was, your network is your net worth. And for me, it's like, I always go back to my best mate's dad, who's a Geordie, who came out to South Africa from Newcastle back in the 80s. And he's built a successful business. And he's, he's like a great entrepreneur. He's like a hardcore, old school hustle and grit kind of entrepreneur. Get just your roll your sleeves up, get dirty kind of entrepreneur. And he always just said to me, you know, Mikey boy, it's not about what you know, it's who you know. And, you know, that's the thing that's always like, it stood fast for me is that, you know, my superpower is I have a photographic memory for people's faces. And then I can connect how I know them, where they're from. I mean, I'm that weird guy that will bump into someone at a grocery store and say, hey, we went to nursery school together and haven't seen them in 35 years. And for me, like that is a huge a huge thing is like networking and connecting dots like that. I mean, that I call myself in my Twitter bio, I'm a professional dot connector because if it wasn't for me being able to connect the dots and being able to pick up the phone, so I've got an idea, let's do this. And in September, there was this, my octopus teacher documentary on Netflix, which is this beautiful story of this guy who goes and he's having a depression and then he decides to find himself and he goes every day and he visits this octopus and documents his journey with it in Cape Town. A few days later, I was like, we, we need to make a parody of this for the creepy crawly pool cleaner. And, you know, within 96 hours, I worked with this director and funny man, comedian, Glenn Biederman Pam. And within 96 hours, we'd pitched the client. We'd had a script pitched via WhatsApp. We had samples of voice notes sent backwards and forwards. We had our references. The film was shot. We then uploaded it and it went viral, like properly globally viral. It's been spoken about on podcasts in Australia. It's had like 5 million views. Mexico is loving it on multiple sites there. It's just been an incredible whirlwind. So, so for me, like that's what helps me drive my excitement is, is networking. I mean, and what a time to be alive. Here I am chatting to a guy on a podcast, sitting in London. Shit, Rich, hey, what a time to be alive. Yeah, it's awesome, man. Two ex cares boys, as luck has it, eh? <laughs> which is uh, it. a bit random, but hey, there, there we go. My, my word of the year is kismet because there's been so much serendipity and serendipity reveals itself in such fascinating ways, especially during the times of a global pandemic. Yeah, now listen, I hear you. And listen, as we wrap up the show, how can people find and connect with you guys? Me personally, I'm uh, Mike Sharman, M-I-K-E-S-H-A-R-M-A-N across the internet. My brand is pretty easy to find. And then matchkit.co is some of what we've spoken about today. Retroviral.coza is my digital marketing business. But yeah, I mean, I'm Mike Sharman, Mike at retroviral.coza. I'm pretty open to being contacted or people want to reach out. I'll tell you if I'm too busy or, hey, let's have a Zoom call. I'm a pretty straightforward kind of dude. But yeah, I mean, if anyone has any questions and they want to shoot a tweet out or shoot an email out, please feel free. And yeah, looking forward to hearing from you. Oh, I like it, man. Brilliant. It's been really interesting getting a glimpse in, into your world and sort of what you guys are doing from a, a match kit perspective. I'm really, really looking forward to watching and seeing your success over the next two to three years. It's going to be, it's going to be pretty awesome, I think. Awesome. Thank you, Rich. And thank you for your support. I really appreciate it. And here's to your podcast also, Growing from Strength to Strength.